Yes, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Uh, my topic today is to uh, restrict to autologous stem cell transplantation in lymphoma. So that's what I'm talking about. Here you have a nice view from Heidelberg. Greetings from Tony Ho, who actually is living there somewhere. Um, now retired, by the way, since a few months. So what will I tell you today? I will speak for a longer while on standard indications in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, I will skip Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, in the interest of time, but also because in our center at least, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma is now the fifth, uh, only on the fifth uh, place uh, in indications for autologous transplantation after myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, amyloidosis, autoimmune diseases, and only then comes Hodgkin's lymphoma. We have only a handful uh, of autotransplants of, for Hodgkin's in the last few years. Uh, and if there's some time left, I would touch on uh, some special situations like HIV-infected patients and double hit lymphoma, which of course is an often disease, but I'm always asked about transplant in a double hit lymphoma, that's why it's on the agenda today. Uh, so what are the main indications within Europe or within the EBMT, which covers more than Europe? Uh, this is uh, a slide capturing the status in 2014, because for that year we have uh, the complete numbers all together. And you can see that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the main indication or the most frequent indication in Europe with more than 1,800 autotransplants per year. Then comes Hodgkin, so the situation in Heidelberg or Germany may be different than in the rest of Europe. Uh, then the third uh, frequent indication is mantle cell lymphoma followed by follicular lymphoma, T-cell lymphoma, and CLL has uh, almost disappeared from the auto-transplant map. Altogether, almost 6,000 autographs have been performed in uh, Europe in the year 2014, and there you can see the kinetics. So, altogether, already uh, two years ago, autologous transplant in lymphoma was going down a little bit, of course, most pronounced in CLL, but also in uh, follicular lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, only peripheral T-cell lymphoma, and mantle cell lymphoma had some increase in numbers. Uh, coming to the standard indication, I will only talk about standard indications today for autologous transplantation. And here you have the most recent uh, EBMT catalog, so to say. It has been expected that we will have another version this year, but probably we have to wait for next year. So this is the 2015 version, and there you can see that for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the standard indication is chemosensitive relapse uh, uh, or uh, chemosensitive relapse beyond uh, first uh, line, of course. Uh, so there has been some rumors about the CORA trial because it uh, suggested that those patients who had a prior rituximab uh, before relapsing had a poor, poorer prognosis and indeed uh, this is the case. Uh, if you look at this curve from the JCO publication in yellow, you can see those patients who had prior rituximab and then had a relapse, mostly an early relapse within the first year after uh, primary treatment. Uh, and there you can see by intent to treat, the outcome is significantly worse than uh, compared to those patients who had uh, uh, rituximab naive um, induction treatment. Uh, and uh, so, so the question was, is in the rituximab era autologous transplantation still an option for relapse or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients? Uh, and I will present you two. A registry study, one from the CIBMTR, which is this one, uh, and they were addressing early failure of frontline rituximab containing chemoimmunotherapy in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, and early failure means relapse within one year, and late rituximab failure means uh, relapse beyond one year, and they had more than 500 patients, 300 were in the 
early failure group and the remainder was in the later failure group, which reflects clinical uh, reality, so to say. And here you can see that if these patients were in remission, were responding to um, salvage chemotherapy, there was no significant difference um, with, uh, beyond the first uh, nine months after transplant. So if you do the type of landmark analysis, you will see that those patients were starting here, uh, that there is no significant difference in the long term. There was a significant difference uh, in uh, disease control because of more relapses in the early failure group, uh, but uh, still the outcome was quite encouraging with 44% three-year progression-free survival. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the colleagues from the US or from the other side of the Atlantic concluded that uh, autologous transplant provides durable disease control to a sizable subset of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, even if they had an early rituximab failure. And for that reason, autologous transplant remains the standard of care in chemosensitive lymphoma, regardless of the timing of disease relapse. And at the EBMT, we made a more or less similar study uh, which was in a way twofold. Uh, we compared autologous transplantation for relapse diffuse large B cell lymphoma by era, meaning uh, before 2001 and after 2001. Uh, and in the latter era, we compared also autologous transplantation with allogeneic transplantation as a first transplant strategy, focusing on those patients who directly went to, into an allogeneic transplantation uh, after relapse. Uh, without having an autologous uh, transplantation. So the first question, uh, with a very huge number of patients, more than 6,000 patients, you can see here, and the both eras uh, were quite comparable in terms of age, performance status, refractoriness at stem cell transplantation. However, the more recent series was more heavily uh, pretreated, and there was a shorter interval between diagnosis and transplant in the more recent series. And this is now the progression-free survival. You can see there was virtually no difference between the pre-rituximab and the rituximab era. And there, uh, actually, there was a trend in favor of the latter series, meaning that those who had a rituximab uh, pre-treatment, or at least were treated in the uh, rituximab era, had a slightly better outcome than those who have been treated before. Uh, then the comparison between autologous transplantation and allogeneic transplantation, meaning myeloablative and reduced intensity uh, conditioning, uh, depicted here separately. Of course, these first allo transplants were much, much fewer in number, uh, and there was also some other unfavorable uh, factors uh, in the allogeneic groups. Uh, with more patients having a poorer uh, performance status, with significantly more patients, almost double, who had uh, a poorer disease status as transplant, and also the pretreatment was much more pronounced in those patients who had an allograph. So, so these groups were not really well um, comparable, uh, and that might explain why uh, in all settings, uh, autologous transplantation was the superior choice in diffuse large B cell lymphoma as a first transplant. So we didn't uh, find any evidence or any hint that might favor uh, going directly to an allo transplant, uh, submitting, uh, skipping the the auto step even in refractory patients. I didn't show that, but, but also in the refractory patients, there was no benefit for using allogeneic transplantation as the first transplant. So uh, this uh, came out of this retrospective study, which of course has many limitations. So it's, it's not uh, the evidence uh, for, for the policy, never do an allogeneic transplant as a first transplant in relapse diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but on the other hand, it doesn't support the strategy, of course. Uh, so I can skip that uh, and jump to mantle cell lymphoma, where uh, 
uh, autologous transplantation, at least in the younger patients, uh, is standard of care in first-line treatment. Uh, and uh, here you have the reason why this is uh, an old study uh, from the Munich group, from the Wolfgang Hiedemann group, which uh, finally showed, oh, it's, it's actually not a single study, it's a pooled analysis from three studies, which finally showed an overall survival benefit uh, of those patients who underwent autologous transplantation as first line. Uh, in, in first-line treatment for mental cell lymphoma. Uh, and part of this was um, collected during the pre-rituximab era. So uh, there is some, it's, it's not the uh, most solid data uh, which one would like to have. Nevertheless, uh, it's considered as standard in mental cell lymphoma. Here you have the over-survival over advantage at five years, 14%. Uh, and uh, then we had this large, successful, prospective trial by the European uh, Mental Cell Network, the MCL Younger Child, which was finally published in The Lancet by Olivier Amin. Uh, and there was a big uh, benefit for the uh, um, intervention group, which means, or the experimental group, so to say. Uh, here it was... Uh, not a comparison transplant versus no transplant. So all of these patients underwent transplant, at least were intent to transplant. Uh, but one group received uh, cytarabin as part of the induction regimen plus rituximab, and the other, that was the so-called French regimen, uh, and the other half received uh, cytarabin-free induction regimen, which was consisting of Archop, more or less. That was the German regimen. Uh, and you can see that the French regimen was significantly better in terms of disease control. This, uh, unfortunately, uh, did not uh, translate into an overall, into a significant overall survival benefit. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it is very clear that those patients who had cytarabin, high dose ROC, had a better disease control than the others. Uh, and this might uh, suggest that there could be some durable disease control, but uh, if you look at this very long follow-up from the Nordic group, the MCL2 15-year follow-up, you can see that in all group, maybe except for the uh, high-risk MIPI group, which is here down below, uh, there are a continuous pattern of relapses. So even after 12 or 14 years, you will have some events here which is not secondary malignancy, uh, and that suggests that with autologous transplantation, even if you use all necessary components, including rituximab and RSC, you have no curative treatment at hand, and mental cell lymphoma with the autotransplant. Uh, and uh, that's why we need some improvement, and here you have the so-called triangle trial, which is currently about to start, or has already started, in some European countries, um, coordinated by the European MCL network, where uh, this is um, this is now the um, standard arm, which is the winner of the MCL younger trial. I've just shown you the data, uh, and then you have this middle arm, and these patients receive ibrutinib in addition to autotransplant and uh, RSC-based induction treatment, and they receive some ibrutinib maintenance. And then we have another experimental arm uh, omitting the transplant, so we're just trying to test if transplant is still necessary if we have ibrutinib in the induction and the maintenance regimen, and we are very curious what will come out of this. Uh, so in the relapse setting also, um, um, autologous transplantation is considered as a standard indication in mental cell lymphoma. Uh, and uh, this is one study, a registry study again from the CRVMTR, uh, showing why here in gray you have those patients who receive autologous transplantation as first transplant intervention in uh, relapsed mental cell lymphoma. And in brown you have those patients who received an allotransplant as first transplant intervention. And it seems, at least from this study, uh, 
that those patients who receive an autotransplant do not wish than those who receive an allotransplant, suggesting that if there wasn't an autotransplant in first line, autologous transplantation uh, may be a good choice uh, in these patients. So what about maintenance tr treatment with rituximab after autografting for mental cell lymphoma? This is the LIMA trial by the LISA group. Uh, coming from French, has been presented at the ESH, and I think the um, main publication is also out. Uh, and uh, this just is a very straightforward um, randomization between those patients who uh, undergo this standard induction and autografting regimen, uh, followed by rituximab maintenance, yes or no. Uh, and here you have the results there was a significantly benefit in terms of event-free survival from the time of randomization uh, for those patients who had rituximab maintenance, which had, uh, after three years, more than 80% uh, event-free survival, which was around 70% or so in the observation group, so still a clear, uh, clearly a benefit. And this was most pronounced in those patients who were MD positive or still MD positive after, uh, uh, after what? Uh, before uh, autotransplant. So, so these, these are the blue patients. They were MD positive post transplant, did not receive rituximab maintenance. And uh, in green here, in green, not so easy to uh, see. These are the patients who were uh, AMD positive uh, prior to transplant and then received rituximab maintenance. So it seems that uh, in these patients, uh, the maintenance is particularly beneficial, whereas in those patients who are already AMD negative prior to transplant, it, uh, the, the difference between maintenance, yes and no, is not that strong and it's questionable if this is significant. So, uh, just in a nutshell, um, autologous transplantation in mental cell lymphoma is considered as standard as in first line and second line therapy if there was no autotransplant already during first line treatment. Uh, it should be done in the first line treatment based on an RSC and rituximab uh, induction regimen. Uh, it doesn't appear that there is a curative potential with autografting in mental cell lymphoma and rituximab maintenance may increase disease control. Follicular lymphoma, uh, not such a frequent indication for autographing as it used before, as I have shown you, considered a standard indication in chemosensitive relapse, not in first-line uh, treatment. And uh, again, asking the question for cure, where we said no for mental cell lymphoma, so what data do we have? This is some long-term data already several years ago that since that was published, uh, where you can see that in the relapse curve, uh, there obviously are plateaus. This is some very long time data pooled from the Boston and the uh, BART series with no events beyond eight years or so. And similar observations were made in Heidelberg, uh, where we had also after uh, seven years or so, no relapse uh, event, and those patients who underwent MRD testing at that time, most of them were MRD negative, suggesting that there is a very good disease control. Uh, and what about rituximab maintenance? There also we have a prospective study, which is the LIM1 trial by the EBMT, published in the JCO four years ago. So, uh, and now we have done, uh, so, so this is the schema of this trial, uh, it was a little complicated comparing two, uh, ha have, having two randomizations. So, so first we had a randomization between an in vivo purging with rituximab, yes or no. So these patients received a dose a two of rituximab prior to PBBC collection and the others not. And then there was a second randomization for rituximab maintenance, yes or no. So altogether we had four arms. And this is an update, this is still a secret, but you won't tell. Uh, this will be uh, presented now at the Lugano meeting, uh, and this is the 12-year follow-up. I think this is very substantial. Again, you can see 
whether or not rituximab maintenance is given, there is only very few relapse events beyond uh, eight years, so very few. Uh, but, but most impressive is that the early disease control benefit we gain with rituximab is uh, not compensated by late relapses or offset by late relapses. So, so it seems that the early rituximab, these two-year rituximab, indeed can provide cure in a way because the relapse risk of those patients who have maintenance rituximab is only half as high as those who have seen, they haven't seen any rituximab. So I think this is very remarkable uh, and this may, may change practice. Uh, what about the type of high-dose therapy? Um, of course, TBI was in the old days the treatment of choice, uh, and the problem with TBI was, uh, as uh, least here and uh, also in other studies, uh, also very huge uh, number of patients here. No, I, don't, I don't think this is correct. No, no, this is only 500. Uh, 93 patients, no, it's not 7,000. Um, but uh, finally, it turned out that uh, although TBI patients had a lower risk of relapse uh, after follicular lymphoma autografting, uh, they had a poorer overall survival, and this was due to a higher risk of secondary malignancies. So uh, these uh, transplants were performed between 85 and 95, so now 30 years ago. Uh, and then we repeated the, this uh, study uh, with a later series, you will see on the next slide, and the results were now just vice versa. So TBI had a better overall survival. Uh, and that was due that in the more recent series, which was performed between 95 and 2007, there was no longer uh, at least up to 12 years post-transplant, but the events used to come here there was no longer, longer a secondary malignancy disadvantage for the TBI group, uh, meaning that the better disease control translates into better progression-free and finally also overall survival uh, if you use TBI instead of BEAM. So this is not translated into clinical practice because TBI became uh, out of fashion, um, but uh, this was the results of the study. So and another issue is, is autologous transplantation good, uh, well, effective in those patients who have an early relapse post-autografting? It seems that this is the case. This data is not published yet, but there are two more or less congruent studies by the Friedman and the Hiddemann group showing that, uh, in particular, in those patients who have an early relapse after uh, first-line treatment, autologous transplantation in follicular lymphoma is beneficial. Why is that important? Because of this study, uh, and I think this is what we all feel is the case, meaning that those patients who have an early relapse uh, after a first-line follicular lymphoma treatment have a poorer overall survival, which is tremendous, as you can see here. Uh, and these patients are, of course, those who have a uh, unmet clinical need in terms of uh, relapse or rescue strategies. And here, again, autologous transplantation could come in. Uh, so what about T-cell lymphoma? Here, it's common practice, and it's considered as a clinical option in the EBMT catalog to do a consolidative autologous transplantation after uh, in-first remission. Uh, and this is largely based on two trials, and I show you one, which is the largest Nordic lymphoma trial, which contained more than 156 patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma, uh, and they underwent a CHOP-based induction regimen. Uh, and uh, at that stage, as you would expect, there was some primary induction failures. So they went on with 125 patients in remission who mobilized. Again, some patients did not mobilize or became progressive. So they uh, ended up with 115 patients prior to autografting. Uh, and uh, after autografting, still there, of, of course, there were some additional events. So this translated into these overall uh, and event-free survival curves, uh, where you end up after five years or so uh, around 40% event-free survival. 
Uh, and this is very consistent. I won't show you all these uh, fields in detail. This is very consistent. Here it is overall survival in all these uh, prospective, more or less prospective trials, which are all non-comparative, by the way, uh, which had been done in peripheral T cell autotransplant in first remission. So what, the, what we have is this. This is a registry study by the Swedish group uh, where uh, autologous transplantation in first remission turned out to be a significant uh, beneficial factor uh, for overall survival uh, in this multivariate analysis. Uh, but there are other data. This is uh, uh, also a retrospective study by the uh, Philadelphia group showing that those patients who were in first complete remission in, with a peripheral T cell lymphoma, and for some reasons, uh, of course, it's not very clear in this type of study why these patients did not get a transplant. At least uh, they had no disadvantage not getting a transplant because you can see this is curves with or without a transplant are more or less superimposable. And we have done uh, more or less a similar study just intend to treat of all patients with peripheral T cell who came through the door. Uh, more than 100 patients were there, or with 99, 99 were put on this retrospective study. Uh, and for some reasons, uh, some of these patients could not be considered for transplant. Uh, and uh, then there was a group who could uh, be transplanted, but for some reasons transplant was not performed, uh, and uh, in the other half transplant was performed, and if you look at the outcome um, of those patients who were not intended to transplant, uh, and those who were intended to transplant, then there was no significant difference. Uh, again, reproducing the Philadelphia results that uh, this is... Um, this is not very clear that this is a, a must to do this autografting in first remission with peripheral T cell lymphoma. What about relapse autotransplant in peripheral T cell lymphoma? Uh, here you can see that, uh, again, going further down the road with the Heidelberg study, so uh, we had altogether 87 patients uh, in this uh, 100 patient series who finally relapsed, so almost all relapsed. Uh, and 36 were eligible to undergo a transplant. Uh, and of these, only seven were eligible for autotransplant. All of them died, uh, whereas half of the allotransplanted patients survived. So this led us to conclude that uh, autologous transplantation in the relapse setting with peripheral T cell lymphoma is not the way to go in contrast to allogenic transplantation. So you should ask Professor Niederwiese to introduce also the ALLO program here in Kaunas, uh, for these patients at least. Uh, and this was also reproduced by the Swedish theory. I will uh, uh, skip that in the interest of time. But the bottom line is that uh, only those patients who underwent allogeneic transplantation in the relapse setting uh, had a chance to survive. Uh, so what about uh, now the standard indication? For autografting in the year 2017, uh, you can see that there is nothing left for CLL. Uh, of course, Hodgkin still is the standard indication first relapse or second remission. Uh, then we have uh, the first line treatment in non alt positive uh, T cell lymphoma. The same accounts for mantle cell lymphoma, whereas for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, standard indications are relapse settings who are sensitive. Uh, finally, if I'm allowed, I may briefly touch on uh, two uh, contributions which were presented now at the Marseille meeting uh, by the Lymphoma Working Party. One is HIV-associated lymphoma and autologous transplantation in the rituximab era presented by Kai Hübel. Uh, and in this retrospective study, we included uh, patients who were 18 years or older with a lymphoma diagnosis uh, who were I HIV positive and underwent a first autologous transplantation between 2007 and 2013. 
uh, we collected 138 patients, mostly as expected were male. The median age was quite young. Most of these patients had aggressive B-cell lymphoma, either diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, or plasmablastic lymphoma. The remainder was largely Hodgkin's. Uh, half of these patients were in complete remission and 16% were refractory at the time of autograft. Thing, uh, of note, 28% uh, of these patients had only a single line of chemotherapy prior to transplant, so these were first-line consolidations. Uh, most of these patients received beam high-dose uh, therapy, uh, and almost all patients continued their HIV-specific treatment during salvage and autologous transplantation. So this is the non-relapse mortality and the relapse curve, uh, while the relapse situation is quite satisfying with only 20% relapse incidence within the first two years. Uh, the uh, non-relapse mortality appears to be a little bit higher than what we would expect in non-HIV patients, but it's not tremendously high, and this translates into a nice progression-free survival of 68% across all these entities altogether. And if you break that down, for the individual entities, you can see that 86% uh, Hodgkin's and Burkitt's were, you may wonder why these patients received an autotransplant, but nevertheless they did. Probably they would have had the same outcome without a transplant, so maybe we should not focus too much on the Burkitt lymphoma patients, but the, the outcome of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, and in particular plasmoblastic lymphoma patients, I think is very encouraging. Uh, and uh, no reason not to do a transplant in HIV um, uh, infected patients. This is the multivariate. I can skip that, and this just summarizes what I just have told you. So uh, let's go finally, and then you're ready for the lunch, uh, to the double hit lymphoma, uh, or how it is now called in the WHO classification, high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 and or BCL6 rearrangement. So, so this is the official term now of double hit. Uh, and uh, this means that there is a coincidence of potent proliferation and survival signals. Uh, these patients have a poor prognosis with a standard archer regimen. And there is some uh, preliminary data suggesting that the prognosis may depend on, MIC, on the MIC translocation partner rather than a second hit. Uh, but that takes us too far away now. Uh, it's up to 10% of all diffuse large B cell lymphoma, probably not so much in every series. Uh, and they have to be distinguished from double expressor lymphoma, uh, where there is the gene product expressed. But these, um, these lymphomas are not considered as a distinct entity in the, uh, in the current version, which is from last year. Um, but only as a prognostic subset of uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and uh, so, so there are two series. Uh, so, uh, looking at transplant uh, as a part of largely first-line treatment uh, in double hit lymphoma, this is 300 patients from the US, uh, and uh, these were advanced lymphomas who end up underwent a standard art shop, which is here down below, or a more intensive, intensive induction, uh, sometimes including uh, transplant, and uh, only a small proportion, but nevertheless. Uh, and uh, some of these also, uh, or, or if not transplanted in first remission, they underwent transplant in the second line. Uh, and there was a big uh, difference in terms of progression-free survival, but uh, no difference in terms of overall survival, meaning that those patients who have a relapse here could be successfully salvaged, and this hints to the fact that transplant might has, have, have had some benefit, and this was also then uh, figured out or, or addressed separately in the study. So those patients who underwent some transplant in complete remission were better than those who did not. This was not statistically significant, but might turn out to be so if the numbers would have been higher. Then, uh, finally, a second study um, 
I think from MD Anderson, uh, and uh, this is about 150 patients of the same age and the same mixture of risk factors were, were, were even worse than the previous study. And again, there were uh, ACHA patients and some more intensive regimen. Uh, and again, there was a small proportion of patients who uh, underwent primary or secondary transplant. Uh, and uh, here you can see a significant benefit now in, in favor of those patients who underwent uh, largely autograph. There were a few allografts in between. Uh, and uh, by multivariate analysis, this remains stable. So a first-line consolidation autotransplant in this study was beneficial in patients with double hit lymphoma. Uh, and um, most interestingly, and in contrast to what you would expect and what we always see, is that the benefit of autografting was not in the sensitive patients. No, it was in the refractory patients. So here you can see those patients who have uh, complete remission after first-line treatment, and there was no benefit of, at all of autografting. But if you look at partial remission, in particular refractory patients, you can see that the uh, transplant patients do as good as the complete remission patients, uh, but the non-transplant patients all die. So this is a little bit surprising. The explanation is not clear, uh, but... We won't solve it today, and for that reason, I conclude for on the diffuse, uh, on the double hit lymphoma, that it seems that autologous transplantation is beneficial as first line consolidation, in particular in non CR patients, whatever the reason might be. Uh, uh, and it might be probably also effective in the salvage setting. The role of allo over autologous transplantation cannot be answered to date. Uh, and having said that, I thank you for your attention. This is another postcard from Heidelberg. Uh, and uh, indeed, Mindagos Andrulis uh, was a nice collaborator. Unfortunately, he left now uh, to Ulm. Uh, and uh, we struggle a little bit about the hematopathology, but we will deal with it. <clears throat> and these are my co-workers from the EBMT, Chronic Malignancy and Lymphoma Working Parties. And of course, uh, I thank you all for your uh, hostility, uh, uh, for hospitality, and Dietger, who made me come here finally.